a musician that goes from an instrument to a mm. computer. But if you, so it would be a weird, a weird case that someone that has no experience with music to concert. Mm. And that's, that's the difference in the, the kind of background of a musician yeah. that takes on the violin yeah. or takes on super collider. I mean, the average person that takes on the violin is probably the first instrument, or, not. or let's imagine that's his first instrument. Mm -hmm. He's going to find the same kind of resistance that mm -hmm. Glad is giving me right now, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, they're very, they're very hard. I, actually, I've, I've gone back to acoustic instruments, like the violin, which it's very, very hard to yeah. play it well. Exactly. But, but it's a great relief uh, to leave the computer and pick up the violin, I find. Well, it you know, makes noise faster. Yeah. yeah, and it's physical, and it's made of wood, and you feel it through yeah. your fingers and your muscles. Yeah. So I feel a real conflict between the like, That's left side, right side kind of issue. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's just, it's just that when I'm on the stage, I feel that I'm in a different mental state than when I'm talking to you now, for example. And if I had my equipment in front of you, I would, and you said, you know, how do you do that? I would have to stop for a really long time, maybe 10 or 20 seconds, to, to get back into that state where I could actually tell you which knob. Mm -hmm. Whereas on the stage, it's of course something that's going to happen as quickly as I can move my hands. And so for me, that's at least in the case of how I've developed as a musician, but I don't think it's exactly. There is a, there is a kind of difference between uh, symbolic thinking and language processing and between playing music. I think this is very, very different. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's, I think it's wonderful you're doing both. Because I think you need to, but I can imagine someone, and I, uh, this, the, I, I know some of these people, who are growing up in a sense with only code. And I think they're going to evolve into something other than what we think of as music. And for example, they have a thing like live coding. Well, they actually want to sit on the stage and do the kind of logical processing, the language processing, which I think of as something I can't do at the same time as when I'm listening to music. Well, it's, it's, like, it's like triggering the, the settings. I mean, it's... No, no, no. <laughs> you do it. Oh, you do live, live coding? Ah, OK. Well, I can't do that. <laughs> That's no, I think that, that, that's a... Uh, in, in a sense, like I think, like philosophical logic thinking mm. is one thing, and mm. then there is creative thinking uh, and imagination, mm. or, or maybe playing music is mm. is, uh, is probably using another side of the brain. Mm. But then, like working with computers is a third thing. It's not one or the other. It's both logic and creative. It's another level of attention. Mm -hmm. But I think not just logic and creative. I think about speed. Music is about speed. And there's a kind of thing that you have to do when you do music, which is to react very quickly, like we are doing now in spontaneously speaking language. But not when you're deciding something. When you're thinking, hmm, how should I do this? So how can I work with this musician that plays the violin so terribly? What can I do? Or, or something like that, you know. How, how can I deal with this? <coughs> That's a kind of a rationalization, a kind of creative thinking or something like that. But it's not like the kind of thinking which you have to do when you're playing with another musician, where you have to respond instantaneously. Okay, this is a, this is yeah. the speed element. The speed element like for me is critical. <laughs> I know there's been a lot of work <laughs> recently with cognitive science, you know, they're talking about it. It's kind of in the news just this week again. They've kind of come up with another Kind of, I think in Germany, some sort of brain scan where they can show how long it takes you to have a rational thought. Mm -hmm. They used to think it was 400 milliseconds. Mm -hmm. Now they're saying ten, seven seconds. Ten seconds. Ten seconds. Mm -hmm. That is not a musical time frame. Yeah. And part of it, I know George always always, 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 always says, and you can see George standing on the stage and he's going and he's saying like, in about ten seconds, I'm going to blow this horn really loud and stop the way it's going to. But that's not the only thing that he does. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the, the, the thought is subconscious, so you, you don't actually think about it, mm -hmm. but your brain... It, the yeah, motoric, no, the brain is working. The, 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 mo the, the motoric sensoric part in mm -hmm. your brain that plays, that plays the horn really loud mm -hmm. is already active, yeah. So, but mm -hmm. we're not aware of it. Mm -hmm. And I think in music also you're in a flow in a way, so if you're in, in, in tune, say, yeah. in the flow, then, then in, in your brain actually the activity shows already, yeah, yeah. but you, you, you're not aware yet. Yeah, and it's not part of it necessarily. Yeah, but I think in love coding. What do you mean? It's not part. I think it is part. Well, it is and it isn't. You just, I mean, you you can think about it as it's going by, but but you've already done it. It's like playing yeah, a game. That's true. That's true. I throw something to you, catch it. You can say, I didn't want to catch that, <laughs> but you caught it. It's too late. You know, because it's a game. Oh, okay. Yeah. You can say, I'm not playing with you anymore. <laughs> Music is more, I think, is kind of like that. 
No, but so basically you catch it because your brain was already active and already saw you yeah. starting to throw it. Well, I'll, I'll, I think that's that's what that, that's what. Well, we but I, I think it's all, it's a big it's bringing up a big problem in the Western Christian Judeo Christian thing, which is about identifying who you are and identifying with rational consciousness and not identifying with all this meat stuff. Well, stuff like sex and music and you know, all those things that happen subconscious, not subconsciously, that's the word we're using, but that happen despite consciousness. <laughs> so I didn't want to do that. I didn't really want to eat that tonight. I didn't want to, I didn't want to fall in love. <laughs> all those things, right? I didn't want to play this music. <laughs> play it again. Sam. So, so say, say that again. We don't, it, we, in other words, not, it's not that we aren't aware of it, it's just that the parts that we're not aware of, we say aren't us. We call it reflexes. I, I still heard, I heard them say that in the conservative just a few months ago. Like, oh yes, we do believe we should encourage motoric, this is a really ancient theory of psychology, it dates from the 19th century, and that's what they're still thinking. Music is like, you know, that's music. It's like, that's music, what? Are you kidding me? This is like, come on, music is much more sophisticated than that. It's not that it's meat <laughs> reflexing, you know, but it's also not, you know, Kant thinking about. Uh, <laughs> but it's true if you're if you're used to, to practicing a lot of riffs, in, and and then you start improvising, that you come up, these riffs come out. So in some ways, it is, and also we want to go beyond that. Obviously, that's why we like to make music. We want to go beyond the, but but. In a way, that also teaches us how to uh, how to play an instrument because we start out yeah. trying out things and playing the same things over and over again yeah. to learn how the instrument feels. Mm -hmm. And I think, for me, in a way, computers, ideally, I mean, I speak about um, 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 ideally, I think playing with a computer could be very similar to actually learning an instrument. Yeah, well, I, I certainly, that that's what David offered me, I think, as an example, as a here he was, I just well, he's actually trying to play with the computer. And so that became a, a, an idea for me. I could, oh, I could play with the computer too. And I was kind of one of those, you know, one of these people who was very unsuccessful playing musical instruments for whatever motivational or limited reflexes reason. And I, and I was looking for another instrument at the time. And this gave me access to music in a way. But it was about playing. It was about playing. It was about the word, the word we use in those days is real time. I don't know why we use that silly word, but it was about playing. But that didn't say enough, apparently. Now I feel like I just have to say play. You know, musical practice, having a musical practice in what kind of music. We should all have a musical practice. So, so, um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm, I don't know if I should say this out loud, but I'm, uh, actually, actually, I'm one of the persons in here who have actually no creative background, but a technical background. In Sound engineer, and uh, uh, recently I've uh, started going researching on the possibilities of actually making music instead of um, instead of uh, recreating. I mean, I studied classical music when I was when I was younger, but I abandoned it because, well, the classical music teaching was very classical. And um, <coughs> the thing is, is that uh, when I work with electronics, I always get this. Um, memory that I memorize how many things can possibly go wrong because usually if I'm doing sound engineering I'm always looking at the performer saying like, okay you're doing it wrong again you're not doing it you're not seeing the right way in the microphone we're going to get feedback and mm -hmm. and when you're out there uh, yeah, and you're trying to do it do it do it again then you start thinking about okay am I doing it the right way now mm -hmm. so it's it, if you actually pick up an instrument and, and start start playing I sort of always um, forget about the electronics, and if I pick up the electronic instrument, I find it difficult to trust it, because I, I yeah. feel like it's something so easy to go wrong. Which brings to the interesting part of going to instruments which you don't know how they work, like for example bicycles, mm. and recording recording various things that aren't, aren't actually instruments, you have absolutely no idea where they <coughs> might be coming from, but it's really good, so stick a microphone a little bit that way and you catch the sound. Mm. So, but um, this this is uh, somehow a difference I find between instruments and electronics. That instruments are something that you can, or I, I feel that I should be able to really trust. Yeah. And I you trust know. electronics. Uh, maybe I don't know how they work. Yeah, but like sometimes I just. Uh, you can trust by. So. <laughs> That's good. No, uh, yeah, but they they are very random yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. But it's I'm like so sometimes these things happen. Like you forget to. Um, the, the plug of the charger, uh, the Mac charger, is very easy to come off, just yeah. enough yeah. to empty the battery, yeah. and then you're 
doing your thing and boop, and the, it's gone. Yeah, yeah it's so happened to all of us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's really annoying. Right. You notice, oh my god, the screen. Why is the screen dimming? Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 huh? She always keeps the tattoo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's so, so easy to get out. Just a little light that says it's, <laughs> it's working. <laughs> But what you're saying is that there is a different, there's a kind of different culture mentality coming from the engineering side. Of it. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think it's because uh, I have a sort of certain background of knowing also how like sound, sound systems work as a whole, like the PA systems, and uh, and I'm also worried always, always like for example, if, if the person who is doing the monitoring is doing a, a good job with the uh, feedback. Well, I saw that last night happened. listening to the ICMC papers or on presentations. Half the papers see the computer as something about perfection and about absolute reproducibility and absolute stability and absolute some sort of control idea. And the other half were about unstability, about like taking a chance in public, but making something that could blow up so I can see what happens when it blows up so I can stop it from blowing up. So you know, even in that world, which is not such a device, device world, both these kinds of worldviews come in, I think. Mm -hmm. It's also in, in, in asking the orchestra musicians. I yeah. Mean, I studied piano, so I had fear of the recitals, but I thought, oh, musicians in the orchestras are all happy and confident because they're all together in the herd, but they're just as nervous. Mm -hmm. They get two notes solo, they're, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, <they're bad. laughs> I think that aspect is... Well, what I also meant, not, but not just the culture of that, but also the, the idea of how you present it, and present it as a, as yeah. a slick, shiny surface, right. or do you present it as a you know, funky jazz... Uh, moment, or do you present it as an experimental, you know, alchemical, like Pauline, creating kind of alchemical moments with people or with mm. machinery. Pauline Alvarez does that very well with people. No, no, it's just that it's, I, I notice those things. I'm very sensitive to that, especially when they send me a bunch of them in the middle of the night at 3 o'clock in the morning. I get under. <laughs> well, I mean, fear is the same. Yeah. The fear is the same, but whether it's playing a Beethoven Sonata or whether it's playing a Mozart Sonata, it's the same. No, I don't think I'm saying that it's, it's, it's about genre, it's about this idea that, about perfection. And for some people see okay. technology as about an yeah, aid to perfect, because he's talking about kind of making mistakes and the idea of not making mistakes, or perfectness, right? That well, it's, it's actually more like that uh, if you have an instrument, it's uh, less likely to have a chaotic influence. Let's say you're playing a flute. Um, yeah, but that's what I'm just saying, it's not different. Yeah. Now, look at the, the reeds of, of hobos. They split, you know, and that one that he that he really needs to get mm -hmm. the, the higher notes or the clarinet. Yeah. Forget. Yeah. They don't yeah. have it in the pocket. They have to. Well, I'm not going to argue with that because I'm not a classical musician, so I have no idea how it actually how it how it, how it actually physical. works. But uh, for my ears, like uh, or my my mind, like for example, if you're um, doing any kind of electronic. Uh, Reproduction of music, nor normal gig or, or whatever. There's always the possibility that something goes goes wrong, and then you then you can just say, well, we had a technical failure, mm -hmm. and that's a completely acceptable yeah. acceptable reason that like, well, the concert wasn't that good, yeah. and we had a technical problem. Okay, that's okay. But if you say like, well, the you know the player was, was a little bit hung over, and it's like, oh, <laughs> that's not a reason anymore. Mm -hmm. Or, or something like that. So technical failures are always... Well, you know that in the 60s and 70s when computers were starting to enter into classical music, one of the reasons composers said they wanted to use them is they were more dependable than musicians, that they would interpret the pieces <laughs> correctly. That's <laughs> not the <laughs> I know, this is actually sad. Well, I, actually, computers have replaced a lot of musicians. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All the sampled sounds and in Hollywood, of all the... So a friend today told me he just bought 14 gigabytes of string samples. Yeah. Today. Yeah. No more jobs for yeah. violinists. <laughs> yeah. Except it isn't quite the same. Oh. Doesn't sound quite the same. Well, but the same thing happened. I was thinking about the way music was produced when multi-track came in. Speaking of tape. Um, the, there was a big difference between what happened in the 60, late 60s and 70s. Think like Motown. Think about all those soul songs you hear with relatively large bands. And those were all done in pretty much in one take in stereo mm -hmm. or four track. And then at a certain point in the 70s, they went to 16, 24 track. And then all the music started being composed, tape line by line, you know, track by track, and then mixing it down to a couple of tracks, and then getting a few more tracks back. And it was built up, you know, kind of the way um, you might say a composer would do it, so the way a band would do it. And the uh, music sounds a lot different in the 80s by the time you get to the 80s. It doesn't sound to me as good as it did 
with the same kind of pop soul music that was being done there, yeah. has lost the kind of uh, um, vibrant uh, speed mm -hmm. that it had in the, in the two-track days. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right. Which is an interesting byproduct technology because then it becomes a tool and kind of a, a different kind of tool. But then other things develop. Yes, yeah. of course. Yeah. Other aesthetics also that became possible. Well, it seems like as soon as digital came in, then live came back because people were hearing a, hearing in a different way. And when good headphones and like this kind of headphone culture, I think improved um, the quality of sound a little bit. Because people, instead of hearing at home on bad speakers, they're listening to it on a little bit better headphones. That's Maybe a little optimistic. It's, it's not true with the impacts in general, but there is a sense in which listening on a headphone can be a more delicate experience. Mm -hmm. than, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. But I think what David was saying before was very really interesting about like the computer that becomes like a, like a, an acoustic uh, music instrument the moment it starts to generate sounds, you no? Know? And and then like mm -hmm. uh, uh, I think maybe. Uh, it's also music from uh, from left to right, which might be more uh, um, in parallel, no? Like a, a software like uh, uh, Cubase or uh, all the like uh, timeline-based yeah. softwares mm -hmm. are uh, in a way doing something which is similar to to the tape mm -hmm. in a way, which is yeah. going, uh, which is mm -hmm. having a direction, no? And it's creating this sort of can you do that with your uh, software with Superbug? To create an instrument? It's always spaced out. Like oh no, she was just saying that you could, <laughs> you could make, the computer, <laughs> make the computer concrete and play it and treat it like a musical instrument and actually get you know, go up there. <laughs> oh, yeah. Spaced out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you've been asking yeah. 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 Actually, the first speeches I did when I came to Holland was on how what I felt was that we needed to make a computer a concrete object rather than an abstract object, rather than an infinite object. Because that seemed to me, when I would go to the big music studios like at Ircom or Stanford especially, because it was more the same place, kind of, um, the emphasis there was the computer was this kind of totally infinite open possibility, set of possibilities. And I always felt like that was a kind of existential <coughs> bad situation to be in. Like, oh my god, everything is possible, nothing is possible, we'll never get anything done. And so the idea for me is, to, is, is I think, from watching um, what David is doing, is that you turn, turn it into something you can touch, something you can actually literally see its limits and feel the edge of it mm -hmm. and push against the edge and feel mm -hmm. it not being able to go any further. Mm -hmm. Of course, it was also a primitive machine, so that's actually as far as it could go. <laughs> I, I like the... Um, I like the analogy of if you make interactive art or music, it's like designing a piece of uh, sports equipment. Like desi you're designing a bicycle. You're not you're not telling the bike bicyclist where to go, where to go. Yeah. but it has handling characteristics, and uh, so it's that that analogy seems. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's that's but I don't know. Maybe, does anybody feel like they would lose something in their their ideal of what the what the computer represents to them. Can you? Does that seem like, a, in other words, I think for some for some people, at least like also 20 or 30 years ago, that that uh, the reason they didn't like us using little computers is to say, well, how can you use such a little? And you're so limiting yourself. Literally, they would say that you're so limiting yourself. You know, look at this one over here. But then you realize, but this one wasn't in real time. That it only was a kind of virtual computer too, because not only was it faster, but it was slower. Because you couldn't get to it. Yeah, you had to come back the next day. You had to wait in line. You had to wait with 18 guys making block on the computer. You had to wait for them to get through, or something. Whatever it was, it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't yours. It wasn't. It wasn't like take something you could play. It was a of that. But, but am I? Are we limiting the computer too much to give it that kind of confidence? It has to keep open. It's natural. Yeah, opening itself up. I think most of the like uh, people always talk, talk about studio recordings and uh, how the um, how the equipment you have in the studio is, is the most important thing that detects it. But like, mm -hmm. 
Uh, actually, most of the impressive recordings I've ever, I ever heard are, are recordings made in somewhere in the forests of Norway with uh, with like a little portable tapes because the, the production office has given the band a certain broad budget because the band mostly spent on alcohol and uh, what left over were like the shitty equipment they bought and that they recorded in their own, own little house in the middle of the forest. And actually, the quality is horrible, but you can actually notice that these people have been. Uh, spending the alcohol in a good way, <laughs> sitting in there for two weeks, uh, trying to actually come yeah. up with the things. And you know, they notice that, like in the studio, if you have a setup of, of one day for one, one person, the mo most of the time actually goes to goes when you try to loosen up the people. It's like, okay, come on, relax, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. play a little bit, and, uh, and that's, some, that's something I don't think that uh, technology can really affect in any kind of way. And it's, it's it's diminishing actually. If you have too much technology, it's too expensive actually, and you have less time to use. I think it's the same same thing right now with studios, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, too much. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry, I actually had one question in mind. It's um, about the um, the quality of of uh, not quality, but the, the nature of electronic music is that um, even though it's uh, interactive and all the performances can be different, if you work with uh, with uh, programs that don't repeat the same thing over over and over again, um, then one of the things about classical music or music in, in general, if you have a piece of music, you, then you have uh, composers who compose them, and then you have the people who interpret them and they present them. You have various persons who present the same piece, mm -hmm. and the versions are always a little bit different. But in, in for example, the, the sort of um, electronic music that is interactive, the former usually stays the same because he's the only person who actually knows the system and everything, how it works. And I'm just curious. Uh, do you feel that this somehow limits the possibilities of music to this one person? Like if after 200 years or 100 years, if you, even if it would be a good piece, who, can, who will play it? Well, it play? I, I don't know about that, but I do know. My own experience is that it has so much to do with the performer, and it can be completely different with a different performer. If it's not fixed, um, for instance, Kosugi has played this piece. He's a wonderful violinist, unlike me. And he, um, it's incredible, his performances are amazing and surprising. They always surprise me, and he, he always thinks of something. So his, so in music, which isn't fixed, it, it's not that there's one composer. The, the result is with, has to do with who is realizing it, mm -hmm. almost as much as who, quote unquote, composed it. I mean, I don't think that, actually, I don't think of these as, I was thinking, Compositions is the wrong word. There are situations mm -hmm. rather than compositions. Mm -hmm. If they're compositions, maybe there's something wrong with them. Maybe they're too mm -hmm. <coughs> I don't know yeah. if that answers. Maybe that's a little bit well, I think off. It, the thing is, you picked the wrong person because he does let different people play or all encourages to. Yeah, I, I was pretty surprised by the answer because I, yeah. I've actually never heard before that. Uh, Composers who compose for electronic music actually mm -hmm. want other people to perform their pieces. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what I've learned is don't give uh, specific instructions to a musician who has a wonderful way of performing and a wonderful imagination because you might get a, re a result that's not as good as if you tell that musician nothing. And that's happened a lot. I mean, it's there's some danger. I mean, it's danger. I mean, sometimes things don't work out so well. It's more uh, adventurous than, than fixing everything. Could you maybe show us what, um, I don't know whether you've shown it in the workshop already today, but could you actually show us what you have Oh, what's program? on the computer? Yeah. You know, it's a, it's a max patch, and they tend to all look the same unless, unless I mean, I can show <laughs> you. You know, it has a bunch of functions. Maybe it doesn't matter if it's running. Or not. This was where was this going? Oh, that was from the violin.
about this adventure aspect that you just uh, mentioned, that it's more adventurous if you work with uh, pieces which offer flexibilities to the performers. Mm. Do you think that adventurous also conveys to the listeners? <coughs> Does it change the aesthetic of the piece? I think so. I think the feeling, I think the truth comes out in music. The, you know, the, the reality of what it is comes across, I think. Maybe, maybe, uh, I mean, we're always, I mean, I always feel when I do a performance, I, I learn, if there is an audience there, you learn something you don't learn when you're alone, don't you think so? Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, we're all, uh, there, I mean, there's an effort to uh, go further or change things, always. I mean, I, I tend to not finish pieces. I think you're that way, too. Mm -hmm. you tend to. It's more of a process that and you work on certain things, and then uh, you mm -hmm. learn something new about it, and you try another thing. <laughs> <another try. Yeah. laughs> yeah. So, I mean, this piece it was done a year ago, but I, I new version. I, today I was trying to remember how to play it, and I found a version from two months ago that was full of things uh, that I couldn't remember how to play, and some of them weren't finished. So I went back to the version from yeah. December, which I knew. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, anyway, I, I mean, the thing, I mean, what's here? There's there's pitch sensing, so... <coughs> uh, I mean, you, if I played pitches on the violin, these little notes would jump around. And then uh, some of it is responding to regions of pitch, so if I play... Um, I use a violin that's tuned down a major second, by the way. <coughs> so if I play something below the G, uh, this this will light up for a minute, and something will change in one of the. It's usually either there'll be a percussive sound, or a harmony will shift, or some sound will shift. If you go that low, I mean that's okay. Yeah, or yeah. then if you are in one of the other regions, mm -hmm. something else will happen. And actually, this is set up for two instruments, and you can choose uh, what whether it's violin or viola or guitar, because it, it's been played by. John King was an electric guitar, so for an electric guitar, the, the ranges are lower. And then um, here, there's a part that I didn't play tonight in the middle where there's a lot of sampling of steady sounds from the violin or viola. Mm -hmm. And then they, um, after they're sampled, they're, they're bent up and down in pitch. And one reason I didn't play it is because um, there's something wrong with it. I mean, I'm trying to make it better. Yeah. What were you doing with the pedals? Oh yeah, the pedals. Um, the pedals were. Um, I wanted. I wanted to not be sitting in front of the computer poking the keys. I wanted to be playing an acoustic instrument. So your feet are available. So um, the four foot pedals do different things to the software. One. One of them, for instance, when you press it. It lets you sample it, something I perhaps did too much tonight. And, um, and then another pedal cancels the uh, sample. Mm -hmm. And um, the pedal on the left changes the, the situation. Mm -hmm. There's play, sample, and adjust. I mean, there's, in this particular piece, there are three situations. So you can. Uh, operate the piece when you're both hands and occupy. It's still a little bit awkward because you have to kind of shift around. Would you call that sort of a theatrical or gestural element information you want to convey as a performer? Well, um, it's more just the reality. I don't want to have to put the, the bow down to hit a switch. Hmm. You know, I might want to be playing continuously. Or thinking of another musician. But are you thinking of the public in doing that? Like it's not not so saying. much. Not so much. I mean, I'm not so proud of the fact that I have foot pedals. I mean, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> foot pedal proud. proud. <laughs> yeah. I mean, a, lot of, a yeah. big part of the aesthetic experience of any live art is the physical gesture. Of the well, that's true. And, and yeah. It, that's true. Unless you're a Richard Barrett who moves as much as yeah, yeah. Glenn Gould. When yeah. you do Latin music, most of the performers sit there like stiff and 
yeah. mm. yeah. type things. Yeah. And yeah. Make something is lost. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I try to address that. And I tend to prefer performers who aren't overtly theatrical. Overtly, okay. Yeah. I, mean, yeah. I like subtle yeah. performers. Well, I like your performance. I mean, you have a sense of listening, which is nice that you're listening while you're doing the course listening. But I mean, there's a sense in which you bring kind of repose and, and the presence that makes it very relaxing for me to, to watch it. Oh, well, um, underneath I'm seething with <laughs> anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> Well, something you mentioned earlier tonight, which is that next year is going to be Merce Cunningham's 90th birthday. Oh, yeah. So I was trying to think of a Merce Cunningham question. But I can't think of a really interesting one, but I was wondering, since, you, since you've been in the band off and on for mm. a long time, mm. what do you think was the influence of Merce on the music and on Cage's aesthetic in some sense? Did you ever, did you ever have any kind of thoughts about that? How Merce, for example, influence working in John Forsyth, he's a very, I mean, his, not just his career, but his whole thinking had a huge influence on the way. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, I think one thing about John Cage, the, the Cunningham Company, when it became very famous, mm -hmm. which happened in the mid 60s, yeah, 60s. Uh, it meant that John Cage became very active and his audiences Expect became much, yeah. much bigger. Yeah. And it was a kind of symbiotic relationship. Mm -hmm. Because um, somehow the audience, for, well, it's because it's such a powerful, uh, because Merce's work is so, mm -hmm. com communicates to a large number yeah. of people. So, I mean, um, for myself, if I'm left to, to my own music, the mm -hmm. audience might be, if I'm lucky, this size. <laughs> and uh, with Cunningham, you have that other experience, which uh, you might be playing music and 2,500 people yeah. might come in. But of course, they're not there for you. Yeah, they're not there for but, you, but, but still, they're there. But they will, they're, they're there and they listen and talk to you afterwards. You yeah, realize yeah, that yeah. Were listening. yeah. So it has a kind of enlarging of the, uh, of the social situation. Mm -hmm. And that certainly uh, affect. I mean, John Cage, <coughs> actually, he, I think he did most of the, uh, he made possible a lot of, Activity for Cunningham by mm -hmm. being very good at convincing people to support it, oh. Oh. and uh, so he made it possible for the company to exist mm -hmm. with some help. And in return, he he got a big audience, not just for himself. I looked up the history of the company; it's over 50 years, 53 years, and there were 44 composers commissioned, uh, and. Uh, of those 44, of course, the composer who did the most pieces was Cage. Mm -hmm. Second was David Tudor. Uh, but still, there were 42 others, yeah. which is pretty good. That's a lot, yeah. Yeah. That's a lot. But I also was thinking, like, did, were there any kind of direct influence in a sense? Because because John Cunningham such, is such a formalist in a certain way, or has so many rules and systems that he uses. Maybe to, maybe there was the. Uh, Maybe there was a, a contrast hmm. because the Cunningham dances, even the events were the element where the uh, they're kind of mod modular, yeah. but they're fixed. Yeah, very fixed. Yeah. And Merce always says the reason they're fixed is because there's a danger of uh, physical harm if yeah. dancers collide at yeah. high speed. Yeah. I don't think that completely answers the question, but it's. But it created a. a a, a, you know, kind of, kind of different kind of grid for the musicians, or something, yeah, something they yeah. could, uh, depend on the, yeah. to move around. Yeah. So, with the music being completely un not synchronized, mm -hmm. uh, at its, I mean, it's sometimes it worked better than others, mm -hmm. but at its best, it gave a wonderful energy somehow because, because it wasn't fixed, so mm -hmm. it, it had some freshness. Mm -hmm. Some of the great pieces, like David Tudor's Sound Dance, do you remember that one? Very loud. Uh, uh, the sound is very, almost angry. It's mm -hmm. very uh, multi-channel, all noise, mm -hmm. percussive. I can't, I'm not describing it well. But anyway, it's, uh, and it happened to be paired with a dance which also has a lot of nervous energy. Mm -hmm. So although there's no uh, coordination, mm -hmm. there was a relation. Mm -hmm. From my experience in Frankfurt, it also gave you the chance to do larger musical gestures that wouldn't make sense in a kind of intimate 
audience situation. That's right. You've had a lot of experience with Forsyth. Yeah. And uh, how, how coordinated is that? Well, I mean, there are lots of uh, appointments, and so there is a kind of structure. There are these points where you have to meet structure. There are places where the music has to stop and start, uh -huh. that sort of thing, because uh -huh. it's very precise um, uh -huh. looking choreography. It is very precise, but mm -hmm. so the music has to be cued. But within those modules, uh, mm -hmm. there's a huge amount of freedom. Mm -hmm. And there isn't a situation where the dancers are depending on a beat. No, or never. No, well, they might be depending on the cue, but not the cue, but not a beat. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Actually, I, I just had an experience. The Cunningham Company revived a 38-year-old piece from 1970, uh, uh, Second Hand, mm -hmm. which was um, which does have coordination, mm -hmm. and it was um, unusual. <laughs> yeah, unusual. It was choreographed to uh, Eric Satie's Socrat. Oh yeah. And then one week before the first performance, uh, the the Satie estate refused to give permission. So John Cage uh, kept the, um, he took the score of Socrata, kept the rhythmic structure, mm -hmm. and uh, used the I Ching to make different uh, melodic lines, yeah. and turned it into a solo piano piece, uh, which is very beautiful. It's very simple. It's, most of it is one note at a time. Mm -hmm. And it has these uh, phrases that's, that are from Santi, so yeah. it has kind of a rhythm of of sati style yeah. but the melodies are twisting and turning in, in ways that no human brain would have thought because it was the i ching yeah. and and there are coordinations in that mm -hmm. and actually i um played it since there wasn't another pianist around i played it with them which has been so i was rehearsing with them for four weeks just recently just oh, last month. Just last month. Yeah. yeah. I find dance very interesting. It's especially interesting when it's a good person. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's all the right. difference. Right. That's other experiences. Which yeah. Mm -hmm. With Forsyth, then you are you um, you're watching the dance. Allegedly, yeah, yeah. But I realized that. Sometimes the music so gets so the, the musical structure gets so complicated that I can miss at least five or ten minutes of the dance and not see it for the first ten or so performances. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. Uh, I had yeah. that experience. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but just the kind of the nearsightedness of musicians and listening and not really focusing. Yeah, yeah. So even though I'm usually sitting with the stage right, at, you know, some place where I could see everything, but I haven't looked up yet. Mm. <laughs> Next week there is a STEM event on tomorrow. On tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> tomorrow next week. <laughs> this week. Tomorrow we have another uh, lecture. Slot. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're having Jonathan Stern, who's called the Red Slot from the Quantum History of Audio Technology. He'll be talking about the MP3s mm -hmm. and how the Quantum History has influenced the rise of that technology. Um, yeah. And also we're going to have a catalog launch. This guy's a historian of sound and has spent a huge amount of time studying the development of the telephone and the microphone and the stethoscope. Mm -hmm. So all these sort of 19th century kinds of developments that led to the telephone are his, that's his territory as far as that. Might be a good person to ask weird questions. Like the fact that he knew that Graham Bell used a real ear. I was like, really? you told me that one now. A real he used a real ear to do his research on <coughs> on membrane. They had to use a, They wanted to use a membrane. They didn't weren't satisfied with cats or whatever you would have used around the lab in those days. But he actually got somebody to lay on him two ears. <laughs> Human ear. Human ear. Yeah, I know. It's. <laughs> 
human ears, yes. <laughs> I haven't finished that part of the book yet, but uh, it's come up again because recently this this French uh, guy that was discovered to have done some um, recordings, yeah, in, in France, but didn't see them as a recording at the time, saw them as a way of visualizing. But then they were able to invert the visualizations back into sound. And part of what this guy's book is about is about that the, the visual does dominate in a lot of these early models of recording sound or something. And that it took them a long time to get to the idea of the sound being the point. <laughs> but it makes sense, because in a sense, sound is very present for us. And what, what's really, imagine yourself in the middle of the 19th century where there's not much electrical anything, there's not much. Mm -hmm. You know, not much technology. The idea of being uh, the idea of being able to see sound is much more interesting than being able to hear something you can already hear. You know, so it turns out that was a lot of their motivation: was being, being able to visualize sound and uh, write sound, inscribe sound. <laughs> so this guy over here, this strange guy, probably worth asking strange questions. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyway, thanks for coming. Yeah, thank you. For